Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I want to welcome you to another episode of Zoom In on the Halal Metropolis. Today, I'm very excited to be visiting with Beirut Saad. Beirut Saad is the Executive Director of the Office of Global Michigan. Um, hi, hi, Beirut. How are you doing? Hi, good. Thank you. So the, the point of this project is to find out how the Muslim community is, you know, coping with the COVID pandemic and also sort of like what people are doing to try and um, to try and make things better here in Michigan. <laughs> so I'm really interested in your office because obviously we've had, we've just transitioned from this period um, of, you know, outright hostility to immigration, to migration, to refugee arrival, to immigrants from the Muslim world. And now we have a new presidential administration. So this isn't entirely COVID related, right? Uh, but we have a new administration which has a new, um, ambition uh, and openness to the rest of the world. And so I, I can only imagine that the, the work of your office has really intensified over the last few months. Uh, but anyway, but instead of me speaking, so why don't you uh, tell us more about what your office does? I don't think that very many people know about the Office of Global Michigan. Yeah, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here and tell people about our office because you're right, um, it's not very well known. So first of all, I should start by saying the Office of Global Michigan was formerly known as the Michigan Office of New Americans or MONA as short. So some people might be more familiar with that name. It was created under Governor Snyder. Um, and then in 2019, Governor Whitmer um, renamed the office, appointed me as executive director, and then moved it over to the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity, you know, believing that, you know, economic equity and economic integration would be really core to our mission, and it was already pretty core to our mission, to be perfectly honest. And so um, the office is made up of um, the state's Office of Refugee Services, um, so the, the office that really oversees uh, the, the state's refugee resettlement program, working directly with um, the Office of Refugee Resettlement within the U.S. Department of Health, Health and Human Services, and then also our, um, you know, local service providers, refugee resettlement agencies and other community service providers. Um, it includes a program called the Michigan International Talent Solutions, which um, was it was up until October of 2020 a direct service provider that worked with high skilled immigrants, um, degreed immigrants who um, who possessed a some sort of post secondary degree from overseas and um, needed help kind of integrating back within their professionalized field. Mm -hmm. um, but however, due to a number of reasons, national immigration trends changing, the, you know, the refugee resettlement program having um, changed so drastically under the former administration, and then a bunch of local budgetary constraints, we've kind of reshifted the office to also go more in line with this, um, uh, you know, these, this programming and, and this narrative around um, centering things around equity conversations. And so our MITS program, still called MITS, is now works working with internal state programs and agencies to help how help them each um, lower barriers mm -hmm. to for immigrants and refugees and really the international community broadly being able to access state resources and services. Um, and then we also oversee the stage three uh, statewide ethnic commissions, uh, which are government appointed commissions, the Hispanic and Latino Commission, the Middle Eastern Commission, and the Asian and Pacific American Commission. So um, essentially the governor has like charged us with helping um, advise on federal and local immigration policy, uh, immigrant integration programs. Um, but then of course, because of the nature of our work, you know, we, we end up working across state government on a variety of things everything from um, COVID, you know, relief, dissemination of information, um, translating materials to, um, you know, workforce development programs or, you know, issues even with the Secretary of State. So, you know, we find ourselves pulled in a lot of different directions. 
Well, so, I mean, so what has this last period been like for you? I mean, um, I, I don't even know how, I can't even imagine how COVID would have affected your life other than the fact that you, you seem to be working at home like I am. <laughs> so how, how has COVID affected our ability to provide services to, to refugees or other, or other immigrants? Well, first I will say that, I, you know, I've been pretty impressed at how a lot of our state services and our state partners have adjusted to this new virtual and work from home environment to be able to uh, ensure continuity of services, but also um, continue to work on improving access to services. Now, we're not a direct service provider, as, as I, as I um, kind of indicated with some of our programs, but really um, quite broadly, we're not a direct service provider. So we work mostly with our partners, advocates, activists, you know, organizations that are on the ground that are direct service providers um, to help really um, help them better deliver their services or, or again, access state government resources and programs. Um, so, I mean, it's definitely um, at the beginning, I think, definitely presented a challenge and how do we continue to do that? And, and then more importantly, how do we identify what are the challenges and the needs on the ground that have um, arisen because of this crisis? Um, and then look at how we can really fill the gaps in our office personally and, and helping address those needs. And so over the last year, um, we've done a number of things to try and um, improve on that. Um, one is at the onset of the pandemic, um, within our office, actually Karen Philippi, who a lot of people know, um, who, who's you know, a member of the Office of Global Michigan, a staff person here, she uh, worked with LEO leadership and others across state government to make funding available for like the immediate translation of information directly related to COVID. Um, and so now um, we, anything COVID related is translated into about four to six languages at least. And languages were based off of the input from our three statewide ethnic commissions, recent refugee arrivals, you know, and really making sure that we were um, addressing as best as we can language access needs of the community. Um, we also work directly with our three statewide ethnic commissions to host a number of information sessions, bringing in the necessary experts to help provide um, information in whatever language or culturally sensitive environment it needed to be in. So we have like workforce development program trainings. We had a small business um, information session working directly with our ethnic chambers of commerce. Um, and, um, and we did a number of things around the census as well, because that was still going on over this yeah. last year, you know. And so, you know, there's still this like continuity of business and things that needed to happen anyway. And then, of course, addressing the challenges that that arose because of COVID. Yeah, the census is still for me, it's just a white knuckle ride because it's so important. <laughs> and uh, it just seems like there were so many, the odds uh, against us getting a really good count were just so, <laughs> there were so many challenges last year to doing to doing a full census. And for one of the populations that you serve, the Middle Eastern community, I mean, it, it was really a bad year because um, the Census Bureau had, I mean, as you know, the Census Bureau had had recommended uh, and had advised to the government that we include a Middle Eastern and North African category. Um, and uh, the, you know, the Trump administration administration turned that down. So we're, we're going to go for another 10 years with having, you know, inadequate, inadequate reporting on the, the, the Middle Eastern population in the state. And as a, as a historian who writes about this community very specifically, this is just devastating news for me and for so many of the service providers in the community. Um, well, so, uh, so, so, so are things looking up in terms of, uh, you know, refugee arrivals and new immigrants to the state? Are things looking up uh, the, with the travel ban gone? Are we going to see the arrival of more, you know, the, the reunification of more Yemeni families in particular? 
Well, you know, hopefully a lot of people have seen some of the announcements that have been made by the Biden administration. I think, at least in my opinion, it's been clear that immigration is a priority. So that's really exciting to see. You know, there's been um, executive order and legislative packages about everything from um, a pathway to citizenship to, um, you know, DACA to refugee arrivals. And so, um, so yes, from our perspective, things are looking up. It's a really exciting time. You know, we're seeing a lot of these things that we've really been hoping for for so long um, start to be um, real ideas that are set forward, you know, and then now there's the pathway to discussion about them and hoping some things coming through. Now, you know, with that in mind, the position of the Office of Global Michigan and a lot of the other states across the country that we work with that have programs similar to ours really believe that it's time for the federal government to take a more holistic approach to looking at immigration and refugee resettlement. And so, you know, I think that prior to this, uh, there's certain lenses that it's discussed through, you know, I think um, a border lens, a security lens, you know, it's it strictly like refugee arrivals, let's, you know, constantly be talking about how we can increase the ceiling on refugee arrivals and welcome more people into the country. Um, and that part is great, but then we also have to remember that you know, immigrants and refugees then come to places like Michigan and they need affordable housing and access to good schools and jobs and programming and then, you know, language access and so on and so forth, right? And so there's so much to be done at the state and local level um, when immigrants and refugees arrive um, that a lot of times doesn't have the, the federal support that we need to get it done. And so um, in addition to really wanting to see these like bold initiatives um, carried um, on and, and certainly seen through, um, it, you know, I think we really not start to need to rethink how we talk about immigration at a federal level and, and the federal government's approach. And, and I think that there have been those conversations. So I know that there's been a lot of advocacy for a federal office of new Americans based in the White House um, within um, the Biden administration's uh, refugee plan. I think it also called on a coordinator again within the White House that would help um, coordinate the refugee resettlement and the increase of arrivals, mm -hmm. which is positive because hopefully it just offers like a central place where someone can bring in all the agencies and offices across federal government necessary to talk about these things. Because with the refugee arrivals, we have to remember that the Trump administration really hollowed out the infrastructure that is necessary to do that resettlement. And so while we would love to see the 125,000 that's, that's been put forward by the administration, um, we have to make sure we're very thoughtful in how we get there. And the most important thing is rebuilding the state and local infrastructure so that when refugees arrive, we can resettle them in a way that allows for their successful integration into the country. Yeah, I did a project a few years ago, a, a project with one of my classes where we um, interviewed Iraqi uh, uh, families that had come here as refugees. We interviewed the people who came from Rafha, so they came in the 90s. And one of the things that we talked to them about was just their experience of, of, of arriving and what it was like and what kind of support they received and, and uh, who supported them and, um, and just, just what it was like for them to try and acclimate. And most of them weren't sent to Michigan. <laughs> most of them, as you know, most of them were resettled in other parts of the country. And then they came here, um, you know, after they exhausted the resources that were available to them in other places, or really as soon as they could, because they had, you know, family here or, or friends here, or um, there was a community infrastructure here that supported them in terms of their, you know, the food and the, you know, religious experience and, you know, all of this, you know, here they could come in and be a part of a community and not, and not feel like they were starting from scratch in the same way. Um, but one of the things we did was we asked them if they had any advice to give to newly arriving people at the time, this was sort of early in the Trump years. And 
we, we were thinking they were talking to Syrians who were coming, you know, like, what is your advice that you would give to Syrians? And uh, it was, it was really, it was really great <laughs> because they had such great advice, things like mow your lawn, you know, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it, the, the, the challenges that, um, that people face when they first arrive. And uh, I mean, it's just, it's just astound, it's stunning for me to think about. So I, I really appreciate the fact that you're thinking holistically uh, about what their needs are. That's incredi incredibly important. So I, I realize that we've run out of time. <laughs> we've run over our time limit, but I All do right, want to ask you one thing um, because I'm concerned. I've been reading a lot about um, the, the, the Asian American community and, and the fact that in the face of COVID, there's been sort of an uptick in, uh, in discrimination or uh, you know, basically, you know, attacks, racist attacks against Asian Americans. And I, I just wonder um, how things are faring for the, for, the, for the Asian and Pacific Islander community here in Michigan. Yeah, it's really concerning what we've seen. And a lot of it has been promulgated by language um, and words that have been used by, you know, elected leaders, um, including some here within the state of Michigan. And so um, you know, I think there's a lot of concern and it's legitimate concern. Now, the APA community, though, is working so hard to really address those, you know, concerns, advocate for um, their folks. And so they've, we've issued, and we've worked alongside them doing that, issuing press releases um, against language used, um, helping host, hold, and coordinate town halls, like Know Your Rights town halls for so they understand um, what is a hate crime and know how to report that. So, I mean, there is concern and there will continue to be concern. And I think there's a lot of legitimate fear. And um, the best that we can do as well within the Office of Global Michigan, but others watching this who have platforms or, or whatever it might be is to continue to push back against this narrative and you know really show that we're here as partners for our APA neighbors um, and supporting them and however we can. Uh, well, thank you, Feirouz. Thank you for the work you do on behalf of the citizens of Michigan, both uh, all of us who've been here for a while and the, and the new arrivals. <laughs> uh, I really appreciate the work you do, and I thank you for taking the time uh, to talk with us today. And I just want to let anybody in the audience know if you have a story that you would like to share, get in touch with us. We're happy to, to learn more about the work, the important work you're doing for the state of Michigan as well. Thank you, Feirouz. Thank you.